Our next talk is about graph databases. Please welcome Francisco Fernandez Castaño. Hi, my name is Francisco Fernandez. I'm from Madrid in Spain. I work as a software engineer in Bicot and I also run the C, C++ user group there in Madrid and also Neo4j user group. And today I'm going to talk about graph databases, a little connected tour. So let's start by the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of people talking about NoSQL, big data, why uh, relational databases don't scale, but these kind of databases, graph databases, are based on graph theory. And graph theory is a bit old topic. Uh, let me introduce you this guy. Uh, probably you, you will know it, him, sorry. Uh, he's Euler. He was a mathematician from the 18th century. And he's the, the guilty of the graph theory. Uh, he developed a lot of mathematical stuff, uh, also the, the graph theory. And he has a lot of time to think and question things to, to himself. And he used, he used to, li to live in Prussia, in Konigsberg. I think that I pronounced it well. And he asked himself, OK, the old town of Konigsberg has seven bridges. Can you take a walk through the town, visiting each part of the town and crossing each, each bridge only once? Does somebody know the, the answer? Well, the answer is no. But this is not the, the interesting part of, of this, this question. With this problem, he started to developing the, the graph theory. And thank you to, to his work, uh, we have this, this kind of algorithms, these graph databases and, and everything. And he ended up defining a graph in this form. It's a very concise form. And a graph is just a, an ordered pair of set of vertices and edges that connect that vertices. I have to read it. I, <laughs> uh, it sounds scary, but we are used to, to deal with graphs every day. Even my mom is, is used to, to deal with graphs. Here we have an example. Here we have a map from the uh, Manhattan Underground. And we have, in one place, we have uh, the stations that are our nodes. And the connection between the, the stations are the relationships or, or the edge of our graph. So probably most of you have come to here to Berlin, and you probably have run some graph algorithm to find how to come here to Alexander Plus. Oh, I am in this place. How can I go to, to Alexander Plus? Probably it's not the, the best, the shortest path, but you have found a solution. OK, but uh, what is a graph database? Does somebody know what is a, a graph database? Any idea? No? OK. It's a very simple concept. It's just a database that uses a graph as a main data structure. Uh, today, I want to talk about Neo4j. And Neo4j implements a property graph. And what is a property graph? Here we have a, the definition of a property graph in a, in a form of a graph. So uh, a property graph stores nodes and also relationship. This relationship connect our nodes. And both of them could have properties. And what are properties? Just a pair of key values. OK? Uh, as I told you, today I'm going to talk about Neo4j. Uh, Neo4j is a graph database. It's written in Java. Sorry, it's not Python. Uh, it provides an ASIC provides exit transactions, a REST interface, a Cypher language, that is a declarative language to query the, the database. It's open source and it's a NoSQL database. But uh, probably you are questioning yourself, why, why should I care about graph databases? Uh, I, I usually work with MongoDB or probably Postgres, MySQL, and everything is OK. Why should I learn a new technology? Well, I think that probably there are a main reason to take care about these, these technologies. And I think that the traditional way, uh, when I mean, I mean with the traditional way, when I work in one with relational databases, if we're dealing with highly connected data, this approach is a bit 
uh, artificial because uh, relational databases uh, weren't designed to, to deal with connected data. So probably we have some, some problems because we have to deal with some meta information, we have to deal with foreign keys. If we are working with a many-to-many -many relationship, we even have to create a new table to hold this meta information. We have to take care that this information is consistent. So I think that we are mixing our data with um, our metadata in, in the relational case. And if we are working with a documental database, we have the same problem. If we, we want to, to work with connected data, the scenario is even worse, I think. We, could have to run, we have to run some Hadoop process or whatever to get some information. And we, don't, we cannot get uh, insight in real time. And we probably face to some scalability problems in a highly connected uh, domains. So probably we will have some problems of, of performance. Um, some guys, uh, the Neo4j in action authors, ran an experiment. They wanted to compare the performance uh, between MySQL and Neo4j in a highly connected environment. So they ran this experiment. They, they model a domain, a social network with a with user that follows uh, between them. And I think that they store a million of users and a lot of relationships between them. And they compared. They wanted to know, uh, give me the friend of my friends, friend of my friend of my friends, until a de uh, depth of five. <coughs> um, uh, here is the table. We can see that there is. Uh, at the first level, the times are similar, but when we go deeper, the, the times are far away from MySQL. Uh, takes a lot of long time to to finish. Uh, why? Why this happens? Probably we will design our relational database in that shape. We will have our user table and then uh, many to many relationship. That this is the relationship. Uh, between users in another table. So each time that we are looking for the friends of one user, we have to look in this table. It's an index lookup, and it has a complexity of log of n, because we are looking for an index. While when we are working with a graph database, they are designed to get the neighborhoods for free. They are stored in, in a shape that we get in a constant order of complexity. What happens when go, go, we go deeper? In a relational environment, we get this complexity because uh, per each uh, depth that we have, we have to look into our table. We have to have an index lookup, so it is multiplied by the name of the depth of our lookup. While when we're working with uh, graph databases, we end up with this complexity because we only have to transverse our graph. Uh, but other reason to, to think about uh, using graph databases could be that we can transform our domain model in a natural way. Uh, when I face to a problem, I usually graph, graph a, a paper and a pen, and I finally ended up with this kind of drawings. Uh, I have some entities, they are related to each other. Uh, the relationship has some semantics. So this is uh, some kind of UML diagram. And if we are using a graph database, we can translate this to um, our storage directly. We don't have to take care about uh, normalizing my model and blah, blah, blah. This, this kind of thing that we have to do when we are working with, with relational databases. Uh, probably using a graph database for, a, I don't know, Storing documents is not the, the best solution, but for other scenarios could be rational, okay? What are the, the use cases for, for graph databases? Uh, okay. For example, we have uh, social networks, the well-known use case. Someone follows, this is the model of Twitter, for example. Then we have other use cases, for example, just partial problems. I want to go from point A to B. So this is a classic algorithm and that is solved using graphs for detecting fraud, authorization, network management, 
to build recommendation systems in real time, and there's a lot of other use cases. Uh, okay. And now I'll start talking about Neo4j. Let me introduce you Cypher. Cypher is a declarative language. Uh, it's ASCII oriented, so we, in some way, we translate our what are we are representing to ASCII code as a drawings. You will see better in later uh, slides, and we look for patterns. Okay. And uh, therefore, they give us these these layers to access to the APIs. Uh, on the top of it, this is ciphers. Then we have we can access to other APIs, transversal API. Uh, we have to write using some JVM language to access to these APIs. We can use Python if, if we want to. And okay, what is the simple simplest thing that we can represent using cipher? This thing. A node is related to another one. A is related to B. On the top we see a drawing, and below we have the cipher representation. The translation is very straightforward, as, as far as you can see. Okay? Then we can represent other things. For example, here I'm telling that Eric Clapton playing Cream. We have one node that is Eric Clapton, and we have Cream, that is a, a band. And we have a relationship with some semantics. So we are relating the two entities using uh, a graph. Then we have our example of a social network. We have uh, some users. In Neo4j, we can label our nodes because uh, probably we want to categorize uh, our, our nodes. So here I'm saying, OK, I have some users, and they are related. They follow each other. <clears throat> then I can also add properties to my to my notes to, to my relationships. Here I'm representing that Eric Clapton has some properties. In that case, uh, a name that is Eric Clapton, and also the relationship has an a property that is a date when he started to play in, in that band. Here I'm trying to represent uh, what bands uh, musicians that play in bands and the styles that these, these bands are labeled. And what is the simplest thing that I can query to, to Cypher? This thing. I am asking to, to Neo4j, give me all the nodes that are related with this uh, relationship, with a relationship that is labeled with playing. So it will give me all the nodes that are related with this relationship, and it returns all, all the nodes. I can look for, for other things. Uh, here I'm asking to, to Neo4j, OK, give me all the nodes that are related with playing, and also in the other side are related with labeled. So basically, it will return me all the nodes that uh, a musician play in a band and the, the style of this band. And it returns some properties. OK? But we can look for some, some particular nodes. Here I'm asking to, to Neo4j, look me in your index, a node that has a property name with a value Clapton. So we will have a starting point. We have the node with uh, this value that represents Eric Clapton, and I want to know all the bands in that Eric Clapton played and the style of this band. This is the, the goal of this, this query. And I return some properties of this, this node. In that case, I get the, the name of Eric Clapton, the name of the band, and the style of, of this band. OK? Then I can look for more, for more patterns here. Here I'm saying to neo 4 OK, uh, find a node with an Eric Clapton again, and give me uh, all the bands that have the style blues. I'm looking for two nodes in that case. I'm asking to Neo4j that look, look me for the node with this property named Clapton, and also this node with the, this property blues. And look for the bands that uh, have these properties, have this properties, mm, have this relationship. And it return order by by some field, and by so, okay. 
Uh, we also can have um, optionality in our relationship here. Uh, we have we evolve our model, and we also add the the, you know, the relationship between a musician and a band, and he, all musician can produce also uh, bands. So here we are looking for all the bands that Clapton play in or produce. And we are filtering by some date. As you can see, it's, at some point, it's similar to SQL. Also, we can, we can have optional depth. Here, I'm saying to Neo4j, OK, look me for all the nodes that are related with this property as a maximum depth of five. So he will look for me, and he, he will be, give me a, A1, A, A2, A, A3, A, A4, A, A5. All the paths, if they are paths until depth of five, he will, he will give me all, all, the, all the nodes. OK? Uh, here we have a more, more developed example. It's a geospatial problem. And uh, my goal is going from a metro station in Madrid to another. So I look for a station, I am in Sol, and I want to go to Retiro. OK, so I look for these two nodes. I ask now for data that, that find for me these two nodes. And then I find all the connections, all the paths that there exist between these two stations. OK, so probably I have one, two, three, or four, I don't know. And, and path to that connect Sol with Retiro. And then I, I reduce, I add all the weights between, between all the stations that is composed the path, and I get the shortest path. Uh, just notice that uh, Neo4j uh, has implemented all this kind of graph algorithm. It provides a shortest path, uh, Distra, a star, all, all of these kind of graph algorithms are implemented in, in Neo4j. This was ju just an, an example. Uh, as I told you, uh, Neo4j uh, give us a REST API to, to query, to create nodes, and, and everything. Uh, there are some occasions where we need to extend this REST API so we can extend Neo4j using extension, uh, manage or unmanage. So we can write some, some algorithm using the API, the transverse API, for example, and we can expose this as an, an endpoint in our API. Uh, well, this is some example written in Java, sorry. Uh, there are drivers for almost every language. As I told you, we access via REST API. If you want to use using Python, I recommend you Pytoneo. Uh, it has a module for Django, I think. And I also, my conclusion, I want to quote Martin Fowler. And instead of just picking a relational database or probably MongoDB, because in Hacker News is the, the trending thing, we have to think about our data and what we have to do with this, this data. Probably. We have to tend to polyglot persistence, have two, three, or five databases in our systems to, to explode this, this data. If you, would, if you want to know more about this topic, I recommend you these three books, NoSQL Distile, Distile by Martin Fowler, Neo4j in Action, and Graph Databases. Uh, also, if you want to, to try it uh, without installing it, I recommend you GraphNDB, that is a Neo4j as a service. Uh, there are some free plans uh, to try it. And OK, questions? I have one. Uh, so this is all very new to me, and I have only a very vague idea about that. But from what I've seen, my impression is that we basically store records in Node, right? 
and we label uh, the edges with the relations that, okay. Uh, so in SQL, when I want to create a, a new record, I have to put it into a table for which I define the type, right? Mm -hmm. So I define all the attributes in advance and I define how they should look like. Uh, I'm, I, am I required to, to do it here as well? Do I actually have to define the type of data which I can store in the node, or can I just do anything with, with the cipher statements? You can do anything that you want. There are no predefined schema. Okay, so this reminds me then of a difference between dynamic and static type languages. It, uh, so so what, what happens if I write a statement in, in a cipher that actually uh, doesn't make sense? Uh, I would ask for, for relation between, or I would create uh, two nodes and connect them with the relation, and then I would create other two nodes that would, have, that would carry different type of data, and I would connect it with the same relation. I could, I could create many statements that probably wouldn't make any sense. Uh, what happens then? Nothing, no. Okay, so, it, so it allows you to store whatever you want. Okay, so, so basically the issues or the problems are solved during the runtime when I run the statement. Yeah, probably it will return nothing if mm -hmm. you are querying something that doesn't make sense or something that you, you didn't store before. But uh, and there are no type checks. Okay. Like in uh, is, are there any advantages that this brings to us? Like dynamically typed languages definitely have some advantages out of this. Well, Do we see something in the data? Yeah, there are advantages. Uh, you can evolve your, your model mm -hmm. uh, as well as to evolve your, your program. You are not tied to a schema or so, for example, if tomorrow I want to, in my example of musicians, I want to ask the engineers that engineer the, the, the albums of these bands, uh, my old queries will still work and it can evolve without touching anything. Okay. It's, it's more agile, this. It's like in NoSQL philosophy. Yeah, but there's some real world scenario where this advantage can actually can play a role would be interesting to me. Uh, thank you for, for your answer, thanks. Hi, uh, in the example that you had where you're searching for two kinds of relationships, mm -hmm. it was uh, artist and producer or musician and producer or something like that? Yeah, yes. that one. That one. In that query, can the result contain the type of connection? Or uh, just... Uh, so here you are, you are storing in the R variable, you have information of this relationship. And so you can get that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this is a silly question. Uh, you're, you're adding all your objects and their relations, and then you have a, a database full of stuff. Is there, are there tools that can sort of introspect that to then just sort of, not UML, but dump out the relationships that you actually have within your database? I can hear you. Can you repeat the question, please? So once you have your database full of data, mm -hmm. um, is there something that can output sort of a summary of the relationships that are stored within the database? Uh, yes, you have a um, web interface that represents graphically what have you stored in your... And that's part of Cypher or part of... Uh, it's part of Neo4j. Okay. And there are other tools like Linktorius, I think, that explore in this way on visualization of your data. Answer this, okay. Thank you for your talk. Um, you said that uh, the relationships you get for free, there are no indexes. Um, and uh, there is just on the slide, I wanted to ask how it is implemented that uh, our date is greater than 1968. So there are actually some internal indexes for comparison or it is linear search. Uh, just uh, when you are looking for properties, uh, in the background, uh, Neo4j use Lucene. So when you are looking in that case for name Clapton, uh, you are using Lucene. So probably this could be a, a handicap of this kind of databases because the, you have to, to go to the index. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. Welcome.
Are there any more questions? No? Okay, thanks a lot for your talk. <laughs>